Good morning. Welcome to Saturday Morning Scripture. Allow me to share this video with one group and we'll get started. Freaks me out when I do something and the whole screen freezes for a second. Okay, there we go. I hope you guys are having a great week. And I pray for those who have been enduring wildfires and hurricanes. And I guess there's more hurricanes on the horizon. Um, and I know they can be devastating. Okay. Good morning, David Larry Carroll. Good morning, Mom. Good morning, Brad Flack. Welcome. Welcome, Jack. So glad you could be here this morning. Um, we're in our series about discipleship. And uh, I like to call it biblical discipleship because there's a lot about, about um, in many churches, Things are said about discipleship, but it's not necessarily taking place. And, um, you know, loosely, you could argue, good morning, Michelle, welcome. You could argue that um, people say discipleship in passing or, or people might think in their minds that, you know, just going to church every Sunday and maybe getting a Bible study in during the week, you know, that's enough. For many years, I've been in churches, and a number of them, not like I know all there is to know about churches, but... In my experience in many churches um, that was enough to be expected um, to you just do the weekly event on on the Sunday and then and then through the week maybe um, one Bible study through the week and, and to be expected and if you're doing that you were good I mean um, perhaps what I missed out on maybe was the conversation at one of those Bible studies where someone offered to you know, talk to me outside of that Bible study, which, you know, that might have happened. Maybe I missed out on all this, you know, up until, you know, I became serious. Maybe I was not ready for discipleship until I was 38, where my story starts, really, where God lit a fire under me. Um, but nevertheless, I'm here to help you um, know about this, because the Lord led me through this personally in such a way that, you know, I'll never be the same and I, I feel compelled to share with everyone. And um, I share the supernatural acts that happened when I shared my testimony. And I think I'll get into that a little bit today. Because for God to do what he did in my life is, is, is incredible. It's unimaginable. To me, it was. Um, and, I, and, and I feel like that happened. I, I need to share. It's a burning desire in my heart so that everyone knows um, to seek the Lord and in this way, and they will be blessed so much by it and given, you know, the fruit of the Spirit will happen. Because, uh, guys, for many years I was, you know, lukewarm and not happy as a believer, but it was because I wasn't doing these things and, you know, applying myself consistently, and which we're going to share. It's about the beginning of this discipline for, for many of us. So, uh, Good morning, Michelle. Good morning, Cheryl. Welcome. Uh, God bless you all. Um, so glad you can join me. And if you're live, uh, speak to me. <laughs> Say hi, like these others have. Um, sometimes I, I have no idea who's watching. So, you know, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Chime in. Not that I expect you to, uh, you know, um, uh, participate necessarily, but by all means, if you want to say amen, if you want to say, you know, hey, Larry, how's that work? Or, you know, I, I love the interaction. As long as it's on topic, <laughs> if you start taking me down a tangent, it's I I get distracted so easily. So I'd rather not that happen. You can always text me or email me or uh, you know through uh, Messenger um, if you have any questions or something that is uh, off topic. So um, let's lift this up to the Lord in prayer and get started. Father, we praise you. Lord, we thank you so much. 
for all that you do. Lord, you bless us um, immeasurably. We are blessed, but we can't count the blessings that you give us, that you uh, protect us, keeping us on your path, protecting us from the evil one, and providing for us the way you do. Lord, help us to know you more. <clears throat> help us to understand and grow and, and knowledge and uh, help, help our ourselves to be rooted in, in your love, that we might love you and love others, Lord, and, and pursue a life of excellence, a life that's worthy of your calling, Lord, that we might be uh, unashamed on that day when you return and we might be prepared and ready um, to to meet you and we look forward to that day Lord, when you come back and we thank you so much for all that you've done and uh, Lord we lift this time up to you help me to articulate help me to get the words out help me to have the passion that I need that this 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 message warrants Lord in Christ's name I pray amen so welcome, 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 everybody. Uh, okay, Michael, good morning, brother. He says, uh, prayers for Sally, his dear wife, who is a, a very dear lady. Um, he says she's back in the hospital, and that is not good news for the Tishnells or for any of his family. Uh, Lord, we pray for Sally. I pray, Lord, that you touch her. I pray, Lord, that you, you just help her to heal in a way that she can leave the hospital and be with her husband again. Lord, we just lift the Tishnells up to you this morning in Jesus' name. Thank you, Michael. Um, we're in uh, part two of uh, the uh, this, of the message, Will You Remain in Him? So the entire series is biblical discipleship, and this is part three because it's, it's a it's a well it's it's the second part of my will you remain in him and i feel like um it, it it doesn't hurt for us to cover a bit what we covered last week because you can't get um i'm telling you there's a reason why the great commission is to make disciples and that's not saying make converts now make converts will be made if the effort of making discipleships happen, the, the, the focus on the church in, in many ways, the North American church has always been to make converts. Um, but I don't think they've properly followed that up in making disciples the way we ought to make disciples. Uh, that's one of my complaints about uh, the way we've done church. The emphasis should always just be on making disciples. If you focus on making disciples, conversion will happen. It just will. And I've known that firsthand, at least for myself, and I've known that for other people. Um, think about it this way. Think about it this way. When, when Jesus asked the disciples to follow him, um, he, would, he would ask them from time to time, who do you say that I am? He would kind of test where they are spiritually but he never focused on, well, you, you, you got to know that I'm the Savior. He never said, he never like, you know, um, uh, pushed them to a point where, you know, he, he, get, he, didn't, he didn't push himself on them is what I'm trying to say. He led them gently and showed them through his works, through his teaching, who he was. And yet they still doubted, but he, he didn't, he didn't push the the emphasis that he was the christ he would test them and he would get you know their answers but um they he just kept on going and you know uh i just think that when the love of christ is in our hearts regardless of who we meet they're they're going to be attracted to us and the holy spirit will give you the words to say and it's not a um it's not something i think that we should approach in a legalistic manner as if to say, first of all, you know, you need to preach Christ to everyone that walks into your life. First of all, we, it, it's preached in many ways in our love for them. Um, in other words, don't worry about the words. And, and, and the second point is, um, 
you know, uh, people have like um, a, a very methodical thought in their mind that this is what people need to know. This four spiritual laws or, or the Roman roads. There's different ways that people have to bring people to Christ and they can be very effective. All I'm saying is that when you're truly led by the Holy Spirit, you know, he will give you the words as Jesus was sitting there at the well with a woman in John 4, um, you know, we know that he didn't say anything that the Father didn't give him to say. So it wasn't like Jesus, you know, had this, you know, script that he was going to play. He met this woman at the well and he wanted what he asked for water. And he said, if you only knew the water that I had, right, he took that situation. It was a situation that he used to help her to see um, things from a spiritual perspective and who he was. And that's what led and guided that conversation. So it's situational um, and how we uh, can lead people to Christ. But this isn't uh, what we're talking about isn't uh, isn't uh, evangelism, is it? Um, but but I mean, that's that's where it goes. But if we focus on discipleship, evangelism will happen. It just it just will because you'll have such an excitement for your Savior and Jesus Christ, and you have such joy that you'll want to share it with other people. So if you focus on discipleship, everything else will happen because this is the foundation that every Christian needs for every Christian work. This is the, uh, like, it's, it's foundational. Every Christian needs discipleship. Not every Christian needs to be an apologetic in, in apologetics. Not every Christian needs to be working in the nursery. Not every Christian needs to be a teacher. Not every Christian needs to be in, um, in, 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 you know, in, uh, in whatever ministry, fill in the blank. There's hundreds of ministries, but every Christian needs to be a disciple. We all have to be sitting at the Lord's feet on a, on a daily basis um, in prayer and in, in, in reading and, um, and we absolutely need fellowship on a regular basis. So um, that's what Matthew 28 is all about. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So this is, uh, this is something, of course, that he says to his disciples, um, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. So we're just being obedient to what the... the, the um, to what Jesus says here, and don't get caught up on the fact that these disciples were the apostles and the super apostles, right? They were still ordinary men, led to do extraordinary things. What you need to understand is um, you need to start where they started. You need to start when Jesus said to follow them stay in discipleship and following him closely. And then at some point in time, at some point in time, when, when you have enough maturity and when you have enough knowledge and understanding, the Holy Spirit will whisper, go to China, bring the message of Jesus Christ to China, go into apologetics, go into teaching, go into the uh in an orphanage and serve at the orphanage go to the soup kitchen you understand what i'm saying he will give you and this may, maybe this would be sooner than later it it, it it works out differently for different people all i'm saying is when you learn to have a discipline of seeking the lord he will give you work so your work initially is simply to follow him if you're just starting out and i want this message to cover all bases so that you know um everyone can learn from it but when when you're just starting out your focus is to follow jesus and it's these primary things these foundational things that will set you on a path it's immeasurable no so look i was started learning this in 2006 and that's how my story goes and i started meeting fellowship meetings and it was just weekly meetings I wasn't reading the Bible daily in 2006. Come the end of 2006, you know, that's when I got the nudge to read the Bible through 2007. That's, that was the beginning of my daily discipline. So look, 
what the Spirit started in 2006 in my life still applies today. Everything I learned 2006 and then 2007 with a daily habit, I still have the daily habit of reading the Word. And it is such a blessing today, so much that I, I want to read the Word. So when it started out, it, it, was, it was an obligation. I admit, it's, don't, don't feel bad that it, it feels like an obligation to you to pick up the Bible. Don't feel bad about it. We're commanded to love God, and you have to know God to love Him. What, what will happen is, if you reach out to Him in the Spirit through prayer and say, Lord, I want to know you more, start talking to Him like He's your spiritual Father which he is, and you know that. And start to develop that relationship with him. And I'm telling you, after time, you will have a greater desire to pray. You will have a greater desire to read his word. And you will have an even greater desire to fellowship with other people that love him because you'll value um, that fellowship. And that will set you on the path towards oneness with your creator. And through that path, he will guide and direct your steps. Um, so there's nothing more excite, exciting in me. I'm sorry, I've been haven't been keeping up with your uh, comments here. I'm eight minutes behind. Michael said thank you, brother, to that prayer. Um, prayers for Sally. Thank you, uh, Janet Hershey. <laughs> Janet, my aunt Janet, mother, uh, 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 wife of uh, Pete Pittman, um, who I love dearly. Uh, uh, hi, Larry. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Janet. I appreciate that. Um, Cheryl says, yes, and when it is not followed by discipleship, so many lives are never changed. Yes, no transformation happens. You get it, Cheryl. And they just get discouraged and go back to the same lifestyle. Yes. Yes, they do. Cheryl, they become the... Uh, sorry, I, I hate it when the, the comments don't automatically scroll. I, got, I need to keep it after them. But, but Cheryl, what you said is so key. When we don't learn the discipline, if we don't establish that, <clears throat> the roots don't grow deep. And then when 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 the it's like this the seed that, that follows the, the falls in the ground and it starts growing, but it doesn't develop the roots, you know, the the the, the, the plant won't continue growing. S fruit won't happen. The, the the cares and the worries of the world come in. And, and it'll, it'll sh it shrink back to the old lifestyle. And I've been there, guys. I've been there in my past where I started on that good path. Um, and, and then I just never continued. I found other things to be more important than the Word of God. I found other things to be more important than prayer. I found more important things than to be meeting with other Christian brothers. And Christ says, these are the most important things you need to be doing. If you do one thing every day is to read some of the Bible, is, is to, to say, God, hey, thank you for giving me another day, and to just seek him in prayer. Um, good morning, Carol. Welcome. I'm glad you could join me. Um, I'm so glad you could join me live. Um, Michael says, amen, excitement in the power of the blood. And he says again, amen, wow, how this corresponds with my sermon tomorrow. Okay. Thank you, Michael. I, I love it when the Holy Spirit works in us like that. I, I can't wait to hear that message. Um, so, um, <laughs> let's review for a little bit before we gain new ground. Um, we need to de develop the discipline. So, so here's, I love this passage. If John Eilers were here, he would, this is one of his favorite passages. We've talked about this before Philippians three, and we'll talk about how huge this is. Uh, verse four, if anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh. I have more. I was circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law, a Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that is in the law. I was blameless. And I'm adding a little bit here. But everything that was a gain to me I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung so that I might may gain Christ and be found in him, 
not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Amen. So he's talking about the value of knowing Christ that surpasses all of his other things. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, pursue Jesus Christ with everything you've got. And that's my message in a nutshell, because you'll, you'll, you'll never regret it. There is no downside to God. Throw everything you can into him. And um, just, uh, this is a daily thing. And, um, and we pursue him daily. And it's something that is a marathon, not a sprint. So if you're only reading a chapter a day, that's, that's fine. Um, but, but I want you to just focus on, 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 on Jesus Christ daily. And we, 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 we can only do that when we spend time in the word and we spend time in prayer. And finding people to fellowship with might be, uh, might be difficult. It, you know, the Lord led me to a certain group of people. And then, and then when I moved to Texas, I had to find another group. And I said, I knew how much I valued fellowship. And uh, I, I put it in the Lord's hands. And he led me to a group of men that, that love Jesus Christ. And they love to read the word of God. We need to hang out with other people that love God with all their heart, that want to read the word of God. And I mean, there's a lot of Christians out there that are not in their Bibles regularly, and they they don't necessarily take fellowship seriously. And um, we need to find the ones that are excited about following Jesus Christ. That is so key. And the Lord will lead you accordingly. So what does it take to know Jesus? What does it take to know Jesus? Paul was converted, of course, when Jesus had already been resurrected. And Jesus personally <laughs> uh, blinded him and told him, you know, set him straight. And so um, <laughs> we're not all going to have uh, conversions like that, are we? But nevertheless, he he found the value of knowing Christ even after, you know, Christ had been ascended. That's why this is so um, good for us to hear, because we can know Christ um, uh, very personally although he's no longer here, although he is here because there at the end of Matthew 28, 28 he says, I am, always, I am with you always to the end of the age. Michael said, great minds directed by a great Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Michael. Yes, indeed. So what does it take to know Jesus? John 4, verses 23, 24, he says, but an hour is coming and is here is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So worship him through the word. Take his word seriously and always look for a way to apply it. What can I learn from this scripture today? Don't read it hastily. Don't read it just to say, oh, I, I checked that checkbox off today got my reading done. No, um, I want you to devour it like anyone does. If you love to eat a nice, juicy uh, piece of steak, um, what do you do? You don't just shove it in your mouth. I hope not. Please don't tell me you paid, you know, $20 for that plate of food and you just downed it in 15 minutes. I, I love to enjoy my food and I love to enjoy my scripture. I love to underline, um, you know, some days, I can afford to spend a little more time than normal, but I don't like to read a chapter and think to myself, what did I just read? So many times we just rush through reading of the Bible and 15 minutes later, we're like, what, what did I read? We are to um, read the Bible in such a way that we actually think about the implications. What does, what does the Holy Spirit mean by that? Um, when Abraham did that, what, what did he think? How do you feel about that? And, and put yourself in those 
situations um, so that we meditate on the word of God. And, and uh, you know, as much as you can throughout the day, and it's difficult. It, that's one of the most difficult things I've found, frankly, is to um, meditate on the word of God throughout the day. And um, on some days I can do that better than others. And it all depends, of course, also how, um, how busy we get. Of course, the busier you get, the more difficult it is. But nevertheless, um, do your best. Uh, we must worship him in spirit and truth. How do we do this? Reading the word. Uh, we worship in spirit through prayer. Be as prayerful as you can. And that's that's difficult. It's very difficult. I can recall a time, and this was, I think, even before 2006. It might have been 2000, whatever. It was a time where it, it, there was a certain day. And I don't know why. There's something about this day. I remember I prayed a very uh, heartfelt prayer in the morning. I was like, you know, some prayers are better than others. I, I prayed, Lord, I said, I, you know, I, I don't know what I said. It was a good prayer. <laughs> I prayed that in the morning. And I remember at the end of the day, I thought to myself, you know, I prayed this morning, but did I think about God at all throughout my day? So this is before I started reading the word diligently. And, uh, and I, I got upset. I was mad at myself because I prayed that prayer and then all day it was almost like I neglected God. And that's where I was that day. And I got angry about it. And uh, so I realized, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I realized my need to have the Lord with me and, and to think about uh, things of God, you know, throughout the day. And that bothered my spirit. <laughs> but you know, the there's there was only one way to um, do that, to make God a greater part of your life. And the more you focus on Him, the greater He will become. The more you read the Word of God, and He led me, you know, in 2007 to read through the Bible. So that year, everything changed for me. I was transformed by the end of 2007, and. Um, you know, the, the biggest reason is because I was in the Bible a lot. I was reading three to four chapters a day. And um, God gave me uh, the ability to do that. And and um, he gave me the, he, he, you know, he made it so that I could work that out. And I shared that uh, year with my brother. And I'll be forever changed because of that. Um, so, so the more you focus on the Lord, the more he'll become part of your life. It, 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 you can't, you can't have it any other way you need to focus on him more and he'll become a greater part of your life and there's no substitute for the holy bible you can find a lot of great christian books but they they don't substitute uh, the holy bible there is absolutely no substitute get to know this book whether you read it listen to it or have it read to you get to know the bible um, and I recommend reading reading a version that's easy to read. Um, at least if you're if you're foreign to scripture, if you're not used to reading scripture, get a uh, get a. I love the NLT. The NLT speaks to me. The CSB is another great version that I've come to really appreciate. The NIV works. It you know it you know and it, I'm not gonna say anything bad about that. Um, make sure you get a Bible that you can understand. Yeah, if you don't understand the King James English of 1611 or even 1873, um, get another Bible. These concepts are all throughout the New Testament uh, to know Christ, to walk with Christ, remain in Christ, keep in fertile soil, be rooted in Christ. Um, we talked about the parable of the sower. Still other seed fell on good ground and it grew up producing fruit. It's the only example of the seed that grew fruit, um, bearing fruit that increased 30, 60, and 100 times. Let anyone who has ears hear, to hear listen. So th th these words were important. Verse 20, Mark 4, verse 20. And those like seed sown on good ground hear the word, welcome it, and produce fruit 30, 60, and 100 times what was sown. So only one example bears fruit. It's the one that's in fertile soil. And like I said, fertile soils, being in the Word of God, being in prayer, and being in regular fellowship, which that's 
you know, fellow, I can't over, uh, over emphasize the importance of fellowship. Walk, continue, remain, abide, keeping momentum, forward progress. This is what daily Bible reading will help you do to gain momentum. We need to be um, on that path and, and stay in that path. That's walking. Walking implies forward direction. So if you're not making any uh, steps on a daily basis to get to know him and look, we're going to fail. You're going to have days. If you're not in a daily reading, have it right now. You're going to fail when you start, you know, your daily discipline. You're going to have days that were just more hectic than others. And you say, Lord, I, I didn't get to read today. Don't feel bad. Don't feel bad about it. If you, well, actually, sorry, I shouldn't say that. If you feel bad, that's good. Take it to Jesus. Say, Jesus, I didn't get to read your word today. Help me tomorrow. So if you ever feel bad, always, always take it to Jesus about anything, of course. You cast your burdens on him and he'll, he'll help you. He'll help you read. He will, but he's not going to make it easy for you. He won't. He wants us to struggle. He wants us to want him so bad against the struggle. That's why he doesn't make life easy. Because we don't we don't grow when we have it easy. We need to understand that. We need adversity. We need to be challenged in order to grow, to be stretched. We cannot grow without adversity. Please get that into your head, in your heart. We need adversity. So he doesn't make it easy for you. That's that's by design. Um, John 15, one of my favorite passages. And I'll just read an excerpt from it, my, my what I read last week. The one who remains in me and I in him produce much fruit because you can do nothing without me. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather them throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. My father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. So, um, remaining in Christ is the same as being the seed that falls in fertile soil. Um, and again, remaining in him, remain in Christ in his teachings of the Bible daily and be in prayer and being, look, it's simple. I'm like a broken record. If anyone's around me, thank you for the amen, Michael. Um, I'm like a broken record um, when, it, when it comes to this because it, it's so simple. I want people to get this message because it will greatly simplify your life by putting Jesus first. It will make your decisions easier. So there's struggle, there's difficulty, but it will be worth it. Your life will be, uh, you'll have greater peace, you'll have greater love, all those benefits of the fruit of the Spirit. But it takes an effort, especially when you're breaking away from a carnal way of following Christ, which is, you know, basically not doing anything, except for maybe that weekly attendance thing on Sundays. Um, Colossians 2. And I don't want to take your church attendance lightly. I, I don't. All I'm saying is um, it's not enough. Colossians 2, verse 6 and 7. So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in him, being rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught and overflowing with gratitude. Yes. Thank you, Michael. He says it's simple. But so many overlook it. Yeah, we overlook it. And what I, what bothers me, what what's a real big pet peeve of mine, is we know the statistics. We know that many, most Christians aren't reading their Bible. They're just not. They might read it for a Bible study. Uh, they might read it, you know, for whatever. But they're not typically in their Bibles daily. And these these Christian authors, or or I should say, pastors, come out with their new book, and they'll want to give their new book to people. And I'm not saying their motives are bad. All I'm saying is if if their audience is not reading the Bible already, and then they give them another book, they're basically saying, read my book, 
And if they're not telling them you need to read the Bible, it's like it's almost like a mixed message. Because I don't want to read a book that people are going to say this is this makes it unnecessary for me. People aren't readers to begin with. And like like me, I haven't been a, a reader for much of my life. And I'm learning that many people just don't read at all anything. And so um, I just I just want to want people to focus on the word of God. Um, I and, and like I said, there's many great Christian books out there, but none of them. None of them replace um, the Holy Scriptures. Um, Galatians 5.22, the, the fruit of the Spirit we're talking about here, the bearing fruit, love, joy, peace, kindness, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And I, we can add another one, thankfulness. Gratitude is another fruit. There was a day where I wasn't thankful for hardly anything at all. And through seeking Christ and remaining in him, he's given me a heart of gratitude. So you learn to thank God for everything. Um, 2 Peter 1, verse 3, his divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness. Get that. His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. By these he has given us very great and precious promises. So that through him, through them, you may share in the divine nature. Get that. We, do, we share in his divine nature. Escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desire. For this very reason, my friends, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. So there's a progression there, supplementing your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, and you, that's where you need knowledge of Scripture. Uh, verse 8, for if you possess these qualities in, in increasing measure, they will keep you from being useless are unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted who has and has forgotten the cleansing of his past sins. So he's talking about backslidden Christians. Christians that lack these things of goodness, knowledge, self-control, endurance. Uh, people that lack those with blind, short-sighted has forgotten the cleansing of his past sins. You never want to get there. Uh, so when you follow Christ and you follow him closely, you will be constantly reminded of how much we fail. So you're reminded of your sin and your sin becomes a bigger deal in your life. Which reminds you of the cleansing of your past sins. And you're more and more thankful to God because he's cleansed you of those sins, past and present and future sins. Um, so if you, if you fail to follow him closely, you lose focus of that. You lose focus of your sins. Your sins are minimized when you don't follow Christ closely. Because you're caught up in the world. If you're not caught up in Christ, you're caught up in the world. I don't think you can have it both ways. If you're if you're focusing and you're remaining in Christ, you don't pay attention to the world. Um, it's not like you're ignorant of it, but you're you're, you're not caught up in the world. Um, so uh, the closer you come to Christ, the more your sin is evident that you see it. That's why, that's why Paul says he was the chief of sinners. And I get that. The more I live, the more I see I'm, I'm the chief of sinners. Because you realize your own thoughts. And you you no longer uh, focus on other people's failings. You start to love other people and you overlook their sins. Like God overlooks ours. And you start to focus on your own sins. And we become, you know, the worst sinners because we know... We know what we're capable of. We know where our thoughts are. Um, 
Verse 10 says, therefore, brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election, because if you do these things, you will never stumble. He's given you uh, a way to live that you'll never stumble. Is that not good news or what? And I got another one coming up from, from John. Um, verse 11, for in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be richly provided for you. Michael says, I have issues when people want to give you a signed copy of their Christian book. They seem self-motivated and make it not about God, but about them seeking fame. It's not about us. It's all about God. Amen, Michael. And I, I mean, I, I don't blame you. It's, you know, we, we, we just can't know that author's heart. Um, but we know, or we should know, we should be ever mindful that um, it's easy to get caught up in fame. And when people start, you know, applauding or um, saying good things about you, it's easy for that to go to our heads. It's easy for us to get um, sidetracked in that way. And um, and I don't want to be there. Um, and, and that's why staying humble is very uh, um, important. And I think of Balaam. Balaam, I think, had a decent relationship with the Lord. When he started out, he was he was concerned with what the Lord thought about how he was to uh, to uh, respond to King Balak of Moab, and uh, but he ended up doing disastrous things. He's always a bad example in Scripture. Balaam, fame and fortune got to Balaam. That much is I think clear in Scripture. Back in uh, it's like Numbers twenty two or something like that. Amen, Michael. It's all about uh, God and not us. 1 John 2, 1 John 2, verses, verse 18. Children, in the last hour, and as, have you, as, as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, e even now many Antichrists have come. But by this we know that is it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us for if they had belonged to us they would have remained with us however they went out so that it might be made clear that none of them belongs to us but you have anointed you have an anointing from the holy one and all of you know the truth i have not written to you because you don't know the truth but because you do know it and because no lie comes from the truth who is the liar if not the one who denies that jesus is the christ this one is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Father has the Son. He who confesses the Son has the Father as well. What you have heard from the beginning is to remain in you. If what you have heard from the beginning remains in you, then you will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has that he himself made to us, eternal life. I have written these things to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you don't need anyone to teach you. Instead, his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true, and is not a lie. Just as it has taught you, remain in him. So now, little children, remain in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that you know this as well. Everyone who does what is right has been born of him. What I love about this, think about this, guys. These, these letters that John wrote, were uh, late compared to everything else in the New Testament. Much later, like 80s, maybe even 90s, the Apostle John um, was, was writing these late. And so think about a man that walked with Christ for three years, and he was one of the closest disciples to Jesus. What is his advice to you? 
remain in, remain in him. How many times is it repeated? Like three or four times here. And it's all throughout that book, 1 John. Um, and here's another one in uh, 2 John, uh, verse 9, because it's just one chapter. 2 John, verse 9. Anyone who does not remain in Christ's teachings but goes beyond it does not have God. The one who remains in that teaching, this one has both the Father and the Son. This is his teaching. As far as John was concerned, um, you know, he knew the teachings of Christ because he, he walked with him. You know, we have the testimony of the four Gospels, and um, they had their letters to the churches, and, and they had their scriptures, the Old Testament. We have it all here conveniently placed in this book of uh, the Bible, all 66 books, is the teachings of Christ, because this is inspired by God. This is led by the Holy Spirit. This book was written by um, many men over many years. So, so my point here, friends, is this book is not only Christian 101 for the beginning believer to read, because the beginning believer, I've known people, I've told the story about my friend Leonard, who did not know Jesus Christ. He started reading this book, starting at the very beginning in Genesis. He started reading in Genesis throughout the Old Testament before he met his Savior, Jesus Christ. Leonard told me twice while he was reading the Old Testament, he said to me, Larry, I'm not the same person today as when I was when I started reading. Think about it, guys. This is someone that's not a Christ follower telling me that the Holy Spirit has been transforming him through the Old Testament. And I probably wasn't praying either. I just thought about the other day. But his spirit was ripe. His spirit was being led to read. I am not the same person today. How does one say that? But this book, if you have the right heart, will transform your life. And so it is Christian 101 in our learning. It is Christian 201. It is Christian 301. It is for the advanced classes of Christianity. We stay in this book. I, I tell you, um, there's so much to be said about this because our, it's our academia that has led us down a path to hell by our churches today because they get us off on tangents like Calvinism and Arminianism and eschatology and all these other areas of doctrine that we need not be concerned about. I, I was caught up in Calvinism, Arminianism for a period of time, and um, it's exhausting. And the, the discussion never ends. The argument is never satisfied. But these, these things, these, these uh, academics, they, they make um, it, it's such a, a, a perfect distraction. Because you think, well, it's a godly thing. And yeah, it is. And you talk about scripture. But, but it's, it's a distraction that we shouldn't have. We need to stay in the teachings of Christ. And that, that's enough. That's sufficient. But they have these process doctrines that you need to spend hours just to learn what their doctrine is. I think there's a problem with that. And we're, we're wrapping up. So I'm not going to get to my story today. I wanted to relate my uh, my testimony in just a way to speak to this subject of discipleship because it's so important about being on the right path. It needs to be included in this. Um, Cheryl says, and you don't stay sin conscious, you get God conscious, and that's when you overcome. Amen. Amen. Right. You're reminded of the sin, but you, you quickly redirect your focus on Jesus, and he reminds you that you're cleansed, that you're, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're paid for. So thank you, Cheryl, for adding those thoughts. But I want to share some time in the Old Testament, and then the next time we resume, which I don't think will be next week because I'm planning a trip to Pennsylvania next week, and when I'm there, I don't know exactly how my next Saturday is going to go, but I, you know, I don't have the same equipment there as I do here, and uh, I'd rather spend time, me you know, meeting with my parents or you know, doing something 
Um, so I think it's my first week off all year. I don't think I've had a Saturday um, that I've not been on this video all year, which is a good track record for me. Um, I've taken this seriously, and I hope you guys do too. Um, so Psalm 1 is, um, well, we're going to spend a little time in the Old Testament before we um, hang up here. So Psalm 1 how happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway with sinners or sit in the company of mockers? Okay, this has a lot to be said about fellowship. You don't want, want to be hanging around, hang around scoffers, mockers. You don't want to be hanging around uh, the wicked, certainly, or um, people that, uh, you know, take, take the Bible lightly. Um, instead, verse 2, his delight is in the Lord's destruction the Lord's instruction, and he meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in all seasons, in its season, and its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. This is the picture of the man who's who's rooted in, in the fertile soil. So you see the connection here. Even in Psalm 1, David was led to write this, and he says, you know, he meditates on the Lord's instruction. He's talking about, you know, the Old Testament, the words of God. He His delight is in the Lord's instruction. He meditates on it day and night. Um, he is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears fruit in its season. I just love that. The parallel is, um, is, is, uh, is so clear between Psalm 1 the parable of the sower, John 15. You see how God connects these, these dots and there's parallels. And even in the Old Testament, they appreciated the daily walk with Christ, at least those that knew the Lord. David was someone that knew the Spirit of God, and he was led to write these words, and these words of wisdom were, have fallen on everyone since then. Um, so remember I told you about Leonard in the, in the Old Testament, you know, it's God's truth, the Old Testament, and, and the Spirit will transform you through that. Psalm 92, verse 12, the righteous thrive like a palm tree and grow like a cedar tree in Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they thrive in the courts of our God. They will, bear, they will still bear fruit in old age, healthy and green. Don't you love the imagery? There's Jeremiah, another testimony in the Old Testament. Planted in the house of the Lord. The house of the Lord is in us today, so um, and will bear fruit. Again, the parallel with uh, John. Is that? I know that was a psalm. It wasn't Jeremiah. I'm about to read Jeremiah. So it was Psalm 92. Another example, and then we're going to wrap it up. One more example. Um, one more example, and then I'm going to read a, one verse from Acts, and we'll close it. Um, Jeremiah 17. This is another great passage. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the person who trusts in mankind. He makes human flesh his strength, and his heart turns from the Lord. He will be like a juniper in the Araba. He cannot see when good comes, but dwells in the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land where no one lives, speaking of being parched. Verse 7. The person who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence indeed is the Lord, is blessed. He will be like a tree planted by water. It sends its roots out toward a stream. It doesn't fear when heat comes, and its foliage remains green. It will not worry in a year of drought or cease producing fruit. Is that not beautiful or what? I just love finding these gems in the Old Testament. Jeremiah was fed by the Holy Spirit to write these words that, that make a, a cohesive message all throughout Scripture. Jesus is the life, right? He says, I am the way, I am the life, I am the truth, and he is the water, he is the living water. Pursue Jesus in his word. Like you know, when you read his word, you're sitting at the feet of Jesus, learning his teaching. And all throughout Jesus' ministry, he was teaching from the Old Testament and these, these concepts of the kingdom of God. 
So we have it all. All we need is in this book. Don't fail to get into it. Don't fail to pick up the discipline of reading scripture. I'm telling you, the more you do, the more you'll appreciate it. Just keep at it. And if you need help, if you need assistance, call me, message me. I'll make myself available to you. Find the guy down the road that has this glow about him every time he talks about the Lord. Find him. Find that one person that can lead you. So, so, so discipleship starts with our making the decision to follow Christ. And perhaps if you need a spiritual father or spiritual mother, the Lord will lead them to you. And I'll get into that. So, because, you know, we all need help in this journey. And if you haven't been following him, you know, you, you know, you, we need, we need, we need that, that person to listen to us because we have problems that creep up that we need to talk to people about. That's why fellowship is so doggone important. What do we know about the practices of the early church? In the early church, we can see these practices, Acts 2, 42. This is in the heyday of the church when people were coming to Christ daily. They were meeting in their homes. Acts 2, verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. We have the apostles' teaching in our New Testament. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So there you have it, folks. The, the early church was all about learning the teachings, which were from the scriptures and the apostles' teaching, and, and they were in the fellowship and they were in the prayer. These are the habits. These are the disciplines of the early church. This is what we need to get back to. So next week, we will start off with my... Uh, I will do a little review, and then I'll, I'll get right into my uh, story, how the Lord has led me. And, guys, um, if you have any prayer requests, give them up. Michael shared his prayer request earlier about his wife, Sally. We'll keep her in prayer. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm apologizing ahead of time for not being uh, on a video next week. If something should change, I'll send another reminder next Friday like I normal, normally do. But I, I don't expect to be doing this, my weekly uh, teaching. And then there's a hurricane in the Gulf, and I might not be able to go to Pennsylvania after all. I have no idea what this week has in store. Lord willing, I will be in Pennsylvania on Tuesday. And uh, uh, Michael, I'll be able to meet with you or anyone else that would like to meet with me in Pennsylvania. That would be great. Um, so let's close in prayer. Like I said, if you have a prayer request, share it here or send me a, a private message. Um, Father, we praise you. Lord, you are, you are majestic. You are marvelous. Your ways are so higher than our ways. And your love far exceeds our concept of love. You loved us so much that you sent your son to die for us, Lord. And your love continues. You continue to protect us. You continue to provide. You continue to lead in a loving way. Your burden is light. Lord, help us to convert our worry into prayer that we might prayerfully seek you and, and, and be given peace and comfort and rest in your spirit. We thank you, Father, for all that you do. Help us to continue this path. Help us to continue doing what you'd have us do, that we might learn more about you daily, that we might share with other believers in a regular basis of what the Lord's doing in our lives. And that, that synergy with other believers is, is electric. It's, it's <clears throat> syner synergy, Lord, at its best. And that we might have this light and, 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 and salt that the world needs that they might know the truth, the truth about Jesus Christ. And we, we just put these things into your hand, Lord. Apart from you, we can do nothing. And we leave this, we, we, we give it over to you now, Lord. And we thank you so much for hearing our prayers, for loving us, and for being with us. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, guys, this has been uh, a wonderful time. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and God bless you all. Have a great week. And like I said, I probably won't see you next week, um, but I'll, I'll let you know if it's otherwise. 
Love you all and God bless.